whatever your theory of evolution is, I would still trust the word of God because I have plenty of ample reason to do so. But depending on how you reconstruct history, I'm going to then look at Genesis and have to ask, how am I understanding this and am I, am I understanding it correctly? Uh, Sarah Postelnik says, Hi Mike, does Luke 11, 50-51 mean that Abel was a prophet? Thank you for your time and blessings to you and the Bible Thinker crew. Well, thank you very much. Let's look, look at Luke. Let's look at look. Luke 11, 50 and 51. The blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Um... Yes. I mean, I'm reading it the same way you are. I read here and he's, he describes a group, all the prophets. He talks about their blood, right? And, and these are those who were killed and persecuted because they were godly. Um, and then he gives examples, Abel and Zechariah. Well, we know Zechariah, Old Testament prophet. This would imply that Abel was somehow being couched as a prophet. Um, let me look real quick. At the Greek, Luke eleven fifty. The word prophet here is prophetes. I mean, yeah, it's just the word prophet. Someone who speaks in behalf of and interprets the will of a supernatural being, often rebuking or predicting events, can be used of poets who are said to be inspired by the gods. That, that's how the word was used across the Greek world, not just with the Christians. But um, but yeah, I mean, here's here's the word prophetes. A proclaimer or expounder of divine matters or concerns that could not ordinarily be known except by special revelation. Um, yeah, how interesting. Why would we consider Abel a prophet? I, I guess the two questions I have immediately when I think about this is, um, do we have records of Jews at the time thinking of Abel as being a prophet? That's one question, and why so? And then... Um, why would Jesus call him a prophet? Was this was this hinting at some truth about Abel that we could look back at Genesis and see it in a fresh way? And all I can think about Abel, all that we know about Abel is he brought an offering that was pleasing to the Lord and it was from the fruit of the ground. And then his brother killed him. Abel, I mean, in a sense, Abel's life itself, it may be prophetic of Jesus, and that fits the passage because Abel is killed. Here, let me show you. Abel is killed because of his godliness. Um, so let's let's read here. Um, Woe to you, for you! And Jesus is going to be killed for the same thing. Jesus is the ultimate messenger of God, the ultimate godly one who is killed for his godliness. That that's my point here. And Abel pictures that in a sense. Maybe there's a sense in which his life is prophetic. I'm just spitballing here with you. So so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, woe to you, for you build the tomb of the pro tombs of the prophets, uh, whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of them, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. This generation, that's the generation ultimately that Jesus is talking about. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary, yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you lawyers, for you've taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. I guess that particular woe is not really super relevant to what we're talking about. But there's a sense in which Jesus is the apex of the persecution of the prophets of God, the messengers of God. In his story, in his parable about um, the, the landowner who sins, uh, he's leased his vineyard and he sends his servants and they beat one and they stone one and they kill another. And then finally he goes, they'll respect my son. And they don't. And then Jesus tells the same audience that, that like all the blood is going to fall on them. And it's, uh, ultimately finally, because they've, they've sinned against the son. They've killed the son, not the ultimate messenger, not just those who predicted him. So yeah, maybe there's an element of something that's going on there with the life of Abel. Um, I wonder, or maybe there's another explanation I just haven't thought of. So Bill and Shark says, or by Land Shark says, uh, can anyone baptize or must one be a pastor? Um, this is a great question. I love this question. And I think that there is no New Testament indication that 
elders or pastors are the ones to do the baptizing. Not that they can't, not that it's not a wonderful thing or that people wouldn't desire for a spiritual leader in their life to be the one, but there's just no indication of that. Um, Jesus tells them, you know, go preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize. It's just something the church does. I'm totally cool with anybody doing a baptism. Personally, I think that this might be culture shock though. If, if in your church, it's always usually the spiritual leaders doing the baptisms. I'm not saying that that's a problem. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I think it's a wonderful thing, but I also don't think it's necessary. Um, there's um, interesting historical records from the relatively early church, not the book of Acts, right? But the early church where um, women were being involved in baptizing. So when a woman was getting baptized, a woman would do the baptism. So here we have a woman who's definitely not an elder. There were no, no women elders throughout church history. This is not a, a regular thing at any point. So these women are not elders. They're not pastors. They're not in those roles, but they're the ones baptizing women. Why? Because of just feeling that there was like this sort of need to have propriety between the genders. And, um, and so it's not, a, not something we typically do, but this couldn't have been possible if historically, at least at that time in church history, they thought you had to have elders doing the, doing the baptizing. So it's not example in the new Testament. It's not taught clearly in the new Testament. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> Philip does a baptism. I'm trying to think of specific ba <clears throat> specific baptisms in the in the scriptures. So Philip does a baptism, but but he's he's leadership, right? Um, Paul gets baptized, but but Ananias is part of that, and he seems like leadership too. So I'm not sure if I have a specific example of someone who's a non-leader baptizing in the New Testament. But it would seem that it's a possibility, biblically speaking, and not a requirement for pastors to do it, biblically speaking, in my view.